Good evening. Today we will study, we will begin the study of a new chapter, namely the chapter on functions of several variables. If you go back to my introductory video, um, when I described the uh, content of the course, I told you that specific to Calculus 3, we basically um, use three large um, groups of functions. Uh, the one that we used before, the so-called vector functions that take um, number as an input, a real number, and returns a vector. Um, this chapter basically kind of goes in the opposite direction. When the function takes, um, or the input of the function is a point in two dimensions or three dimensions, or a vector for that matter. That is to say, the input is given by one, excuse me, two or more variables, two or three in this case, because remember in, in this class we're going to deal with um, uh, 2D or 3D spaces. So the input is a point um, in um, two dimensions or three dimensions, like for example XY or XYZ, or for example a vector that points to, to these, these points, and the output of the function is a real number. So if um, there is there is a lot of motivation, but let's just mention just one or two. Nothing special about my examples, but just for um, for the sake of it, the sky's the limit in really in terms of which quantities depend on more than one quantity. So right now, um, if you go back to calculus one or two, um, the main ingredient was a function of a single variable, right? So we talked about just. Um, functions for which or quantities that depend on another quantity not more than one when does the quantity may depend on two or more um, numbers as, as I said the sky is the limit but let's uh, many of many of my students are uh, meteorology majors right so here's a quantity like um, the wind chill index the so-called wind chill index which is the perceived temperature uh, in your body um, which is basically a come because of the wind and of course the the value of the temperature so as you can realize already i mentioned that this uh, quantity whatever it is should depend um, on two quantities the wind speed and the temperature right so the wind chill index obviously as the name implies cannot be a quantity that uh, can be that can be described by a traditional function of over single variables, right? You need two um, inputs in the domain, <clears throat> uh, two values. Um, here is an example when you need um, uh, the input as a point in three D. Um, you know, I like to give this example because um, um, you know this this topic probably comes up in the health uh, assessments quite often. Um, I don't know how many people realize this or not, but the total cholesterol right, that they measure in the in the typical lab work actually it's a function of three variables. So let's let's call this um, it's actually a formula given by the low density cholesterol plus the amount of triglyceride plus, um, um, let me see if actually, let me, let me double check something here. No, the other way around, so oh, triglyceride over five, one of them is divided by five, yeah, plus the high density cholesterol, the so-called good cholesterol. So in shortcut, you know, C, the total cholesterol is actually a function of three variables, low density or LDL as it's, as it's uh, called sometimes, um, triglyceride um, and uh, high density cholesterol. So the formula is L plus T over 5 plus uh, H. And actually, incidentally, as far as I know, in fact, um, the total, the, um, um, uh, the triglycerides and the high density cholesterols are actually measured. So in fact, the LDL is calculated via this formula. And it can be measured directly, but that's a separate lab work. But anyway, <laughs> that's an update detour from, uh, from the math side of it. So plenty of examples. I hope you agree. Let's actually write some formal notation. 
and you will see that just because of the nature of the math related to it, we can actually say a little bit more um, or um, discuss a little bit more about functions of two variables simply because there are um, more intuitive ways of representing these functions. So we're going to spend some time with functions of two variables and then of three variables. But let's write some um, a numerical example. So let's say I have a function of two variables given by square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared. Like any function, one of the first um, questions you may ask is what is the domain? And just like in calculus 1, um, unless otherwise specified, there is no um, external restriction of some sort, um, you should assume that the domain includes all um, um, it includes all real numbers for which the expression makes sense. So all x, y for which uh, that expression f of x, y uh, is valid or makes sense mathematically speaking. What does that mean, you know, particularly? I mean, sometimes any possible value, any pair of values x and y can, um, uh, can be plugged in. Otherwise, there are restrictions coming from... Um, the uh, the math itself that you put into the function here. So in this case, you have a square root, right? Or for that matter, any radical of an even index. Um, you cannot plug in anything that makes this quantity negative, right? So for this function to exist, we need the quantity under the radical to be greater than or equal to zero. So what does that mean? It means that if you think about it, so that's, that's basically the domain. The domain, of course, can be specified just by this. You could say that the domain is all x, y such that uh, 4 minus x squared minus y squared is greater than or equal to 0. Or if possible, you can also um, describe it in more um, geometrical details. Again, if it turns out that this is something that you can visualize geometrically. What I want to point out is that typically this will be actually a region in um, R2, right? In, uh, in the two-dimensional system. Uh, and in this case, I made it so that it's recognizable, right? I mean, if you manipulate this, this expression a little bit, that's going to be x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 4. And um, that means the domain happens to be the interior of the circle of radius 2 and center 0, 0. Or the disk, okay, the solid disk. The, excuse me, the, the full disk, right, of, uh, of radius 2. So a correct way of, um, of sketching the domain if I sketch just the domain, would be not just the circle of radius 2, but the entire interior of it, right? All the points for which x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 4. <clears throat> now, um, what about the va value of the function itself? So you see, let's say I want to plug in uh, the point 1, 1 and see what the function is all equal to, right? So f of 1, 1 is equal to square root of 4 minus 1 squared minus 1 squared. That's going to be square root of 2. But where do I label? If I want to come up with something called the graph of a function, right, that's another thing you may think about. What is the graph of a function, of a function of two variables? Where do I place the value of the function itself if the domain occupies a region in the um, x, y plane. Because remember in calculus 1, um, because you have only two variables, the x axis was for the domain, the y axis was for the, uh, the value of the function. You could, for example, take separately an axis here and say I'm going to place the value square root of 2 somewhere here and I'm going to make an arrow and then I say that 1, 1 goes into the value square root of 2. But that's obviously not practical, and one quick fix is to make use of the third axis that we can visualize, right? We are three-dimensional beings. We can visualize in three dimension, and we can reserve the z-axis for the values of the function itself, of f of x, y. And so for that reason, just like in calculus 1, if you look at the top of the page, 
we typically denote the function by y equals f of x just to indicate that the value of the function is going to be um, labeled uh, or placed on the y-axis. In the same manner, a function of two variables is typically denoted by z of z equals f of xy, right? Because you're going to place the value of the function on the z-axis. So in, my, in, in this example that I, I came up with here, um, if you want to come up with the graph of the function, then the whole idea is to visualize what is actually z equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared for all possible values of x, y in that disk we talked about. And again, often there is no specific shape that you can talk about. It's just a generic surface, right? You're going to end up typically with a surface because you have these points that you plug in into the domain from the region um, given, that gives the domain. And then you're going to have a bunch of points in space um, and that will form a surface. So in general, the graph uh, of a function of two variables is going to be a surface. Again, sometimes a recognizable one. Obviously, I make it this one to be recognizable. So let's see what we end up with. I mean, if I manipulate, of course, the terms a little bit, a little bit if I square both sides, I hope everybody recognizes that it turns out that the graph of the function sits on a sphere of radius 2 and center 0, 0, 0. But we have to be careful here because, as you'll see immediately, that's not going to be the whole sphere. So let's see if we can fit in the graph here. And I'm going to use different colors, hopefully make it... Uh, and by the way, at the end of the um, uh, written part, make sure you go over the... you watch the... Um, very important, right? To watch the um, um, maple presentation. So just a presentation on the uh, with maple to see these examples. Um, so in this case, so this is the x-axis. This is y, and this is z. And the domain is going to be like I said, the disk of radius two. As I said, I want to make a different color. So let's make the domain with green. And notice that the z value should be positive because z is the positive square root, right? Square root of four minus x squared minus y squared. So actually uh, the z values are like, like I said, are on this sphere of radius two but just the upper half of the sphere, right? Because it corresponds to the positive z. Normally, when you square it, you basically, when you take, when you, when you square these both sides, then I just did it so you can recognize it belongs to a sphere, but we only take the positive z, so basically just the upper hemisphere is going to be the graph of our function. And then let's use the um, blue color for the graph of the function itself. So that's going to be the upper sphere. Uh, hemisphere, right? Again, of radius 2. So this is what constitutes z equals f of x, y. And uh, like I said before, if you um, uh, want to plug in a point in the function to visualize it here, let's say I plug in the point 1.1 1. 1 into, into the function, right here on the surface is going to be f of 1.1. 1. 1 which is going to be square root of 2. So if you do the graph intuitively, all you do, you raise perpendiculars over each um, point on the domain and measure the value of uh, the z coordinate, whether it's positive or negative, depending on the case. Of course, it can be both, right? I mean, you can have a complicated function that has a portion above or below the, um, the xy plane. So um, let's move on with uh, further examples um, on the next page. Okay, so I wrote again just a generic way to uh, describe the graph of a function of two variables, z equals f of x, y, right? So typically the domain, like I said before, occupies a region in the x, y plane, um, and then um, the corresponding graph that comes from plugging in each point on the domain 
into the function generates another surface which constitutes the graph of the function of two variables right so if i pick a point a b plug it into the function that gives me a real value that's going to be at the z coordinate um, um, of this point i mean so the point on the graph is going to be the z co um, corresponding to that z coordinate f of a b so whatever the point you there is in the in the actual graph now in many applications, we're not going to use this too often, but especially in meteorology, you actually encounter this quite often. There is another way. Um, there is another way of representing uh, a function of two variables. Actually, even three variables, but it's far more useful in, for two variables. This technique. So um, another way of representing a function of uh, two variables. This is using the so-called method of level curves. <clears throat> so what does that mean? Let's say I don't want to have a 3D picture of the function itself, because it might, might not be actually easy to visualize, especially if the function is overly complicated, which is the case in real life situations. So the level curves simply means, and it's better to actually understand it with the examples, simply means um, uh, sketching the uh, portions of the domain that give the same value of f of x y or f of x y z in the case of of a function of three variables so let's actually illustrate with um with a simple example what what does that entail <clears throat> so suppose i have um a function given by square root of x y right uh in this case by the way the domain if i were to describe the domain is all numbers x y i mean all pairs of numbers such that x y greater than or equal to zero x times y greater than zero right because because you have the square root there i mean that means either both x should be positive and y should be positive or both negative right which means that the domain is really the first and the third quadrant right so if i um if i were to sketch the the domain in the x y plane again let's use a different color let's use um let's use again green uh this is really the domain here uh let's see what's the best way to yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna actually make any lines on it just just visualize that this these are the region that encapsulate the domain over here Right, the first and the second quadrant, uh, and the third quadrant. <clears throat> and like I said, instead of actually putting the z-axis there, let's say I want to see which portions of the domain um, give you the same number for the function itself. So in other words, let's say I want to figure out which points in the domain will make the function equal to 1. Nothing special, by the way, uh, about this 1. Okay, you can actually place any value in fact in practice using computer uh, com computer algebra systems usually right you have a sample of values of interest so for example you just put let's say 100 values of interest depending on the meaning of the function so you have basically a sample of um, which points um, are going to be given by that function um, i mean which points in the domain will will be sent into those values let's say one in this case, let's do another one. Let's say f of x, y equals 2, or f of x, y equals 3. Let's just use positive ones. Uh, I mean, obviously, it has to be positive because square root of x, y is positive, right? So the function can take only positive values. So <clears throat> when, let's look at the first one right, right here, okay? So f of x, y equals 1. That means square root of x, y is equal to 1. And then the question is, what does this represent, right? I mean, the, this equation, square root of x, y equals 1. So it's going to be typically a curve. Sometimes, again, in more complicated situations, it could be a family of curves, right? Um, and 
you can actually sketch it in this particular case you can recognize the shape of it just just by the way you sketch any single variable functions from calculus one but again don't lose track the meaning of it right so we set it equal to one because i simply want to figure out what is x and y where are these points located for which the function is equal to one so they are located if i square both sides of this radical they are located at the curve x y equals one uh, if you wanted to write it as a single variable function, that's going to be uh, y equals 1 over x. We take that equal to 0, obviously, right? So if I sketch y equals 1 over x, and I'm going to use uh, here, uh, let's say, um, let me think a little bit uh, with, the, with the color coding. Let's use a different color here just to emphasize it. So y equals 1 over x is going to be this way. And I can label this, um, this, so it's given by two pieces, right? So I can label this curve with one, just to indicate that the function f of x, y takes the value one whenever I plug in any point on that curve, right? So for example, I know that if I plug in this point, let's say this point is, um, um, one of, excuse me, uh, minus one over four, um, uh, minus four, right? So, I mean, if I plug it in into the function, obviously it's gonna be square root of minus one over four times minus four, four cancels, so that's gonna be equal to one. But again, I visualize all the points for which the value of the function is equal to one. And I can continue to sample these um, uh, values as often as I want. Let's say I want to figure out where the value two is located. That means square root of x, y is equal to two. That corresponds to x, y equals four. That means y equals four over x. In relation to the previous level curve, these are called level curves, this is gonna be further away from the previous one. So let's use the blue color for this one. Um, it's gonna look like this. It's still asymptotic to the axis, but I just, I won't have room to expand it left and right. So in this case, the level curve is four. So every point you plug in in the domain into the function on this curve, the value of the function will be four. And the same thing for the next one, right? So this will be nine and, and so on and so forth. We're gonna show this with Maple in a minute. I mean, not in a minute, just at the end of, uh, of this discussion. So why is this actually very useful? So let me let me show you, and, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with, a, I'm gonna show you actually the, a page with a picture, a more realistic picture. Um, this is very useful, for instance, in meteorological maps. For instance, you have a map in meteorological uh, applications that shows the so-called isobars. That is the lines on the map, I should say the curves on the map, with the same pressure. So what does this, uh, how does this relate to uh, atmospheric pressure, that is? So how does this relate to a function of two variables? Well, in this case, basically, since you have a 2D map, a representation of the terrain, the pressure, pressure is gonna depend on the location of that terrain, right? So then it's gonna be a function of x, y, where x, y is, are basically the actual coordinates um, um, on that location. The GPS, the, co the geographical coordinates. So it's a function of two variables, right? The function, the pressure is at a certain value at that, at that point, but the point is given by two values, the coordinates, um, the geographical coordinates. Now the problem is that these lines of constant pressures are very irregular, right? So if I see a map like this, you know, you could have, let's say, uh, an isobar like this for which the pressure is, let's say, 100, um, or let's say, I don't know, 300, I don't know actually what the realistic numbers are. And let's say another one, uh, let me see, going like that, let's say this is gonna be um, 500, let's label it this way, and another one, 
like this. Let's see. I want to make it like this. And let's say this this one here um, is going to be labeled with um, I don't know 900. So just by looking at the difference of pressure difference in pressure at nearby points uh, I can um, so by looking at that I can estimate for example the wind direction and how strong it is a little bit of a problem here okay so there was a little bit of a loss of connection between my tablet and the and the right in the writing tablet so let let me let me say 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 it again so the difference in pressure at nearby points using that i can estimate the wind direction and how strong that wind is so what i mean is that you know if you look at the map here um, now, obviously, how does the wind, I mean, the, the wind uh, basically flows uh, from high pressure to low pressure, right? Like, for example, if I'm, if I'm here, I know that the direction of the wind is like that. And um, obviously, where the wind is strongest is where the drop in pressure is the strongest from one point to another, right? So if I look at the region where the isobars are closest together that is the region where the um, wind is the strongest so indeed it's very useful to actually visualize a function of two variables in this fashion level curves because it's easy to see to look on, on the map so to to recap level curves is simply a way a very simple way to add the third information on the same plane as the domain. So the, the, the plane, the XY plane, um, you know, you represent the domain on the XY plane, but you can also add the information for the function itself on that, uh, on the same plane by simply looking at these level curves and labeling the level curves with the corresponding value of the function itself. So uh, let's move on to the next page. So what about functions uh, of three variables? There is one important remark we want to make here to, for you to keep in mind from now on as we move along with this material. But let's, let's take an example kind of similar to the previous ones. Let's say g of x, y, z is square root of 9 minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared. Um, let's actually... Um, pick another one as well so let's say we have uh, h of xyz given by square root of 1 minus x squared uh, plus square root of 4 minus y squared plus square root of let's say um, um, 25 minus z squared okay in a one thing to keep in mind here because these are function of three variables so let's let's do this let's write down this this important remark remember we are three-dimensional beings right in a case of a function of three variables so for a function f of x y z the domain is typically a solid in 3d so the coordinate system so that means we can only visualize the domain in a 3d coordinate system not the value of the function itself so not f of x y z itself I mean, there are ways to go about it with something called level surfaces, but by default, 
um, if you actually establish the domain and you sketch it, realize that you're going to need all three axes to represent the domain. So make sure you don't confuse the domain with the actual value of the function. So by default, typically when we try to visualize a function of three variables, we stick to the domain and the value of the function itself, either we um, make do without labeling it anywhere, or maybe we could use alternative ways like, as you'll see later, the so-called level surfaces. But again, that's not always useful. So let's take, take a look at g of x, y, z, right? Just like before, to establish the domain, uh, because that radical needs to be positive, right? Uh, I need that quantity to be positive under the radical. And if I rewrite these terms, I can see that this is going to be a solid ball of radius 3. So the domain itself um, is going to be, right, I, may, I want to emphasize that it's a solid here, is going to be a, a sphere, in other words, or a solid sphere, a solid ball of radius 3. Again, not f of x, y, z, just the domain of a g of x, y, z. What is the value of the function? Well, like I said, we make do without labeling it on any axis for that matter. So let's say I want to figure out what is g of minus 1, 0, 2. Nothing fancy about it, just plug in um, x minus 1 for x, 0 for y, um, 2 for z, and then see what you get, right? So that's going to be 9 minus 1, which is 8, minus 4, square root of 4, which is 2. <clears throat> All right. There is an analogous procedure to kind of visualize the value of the function itself by what we what something called level surfaces. The procedure is the same, right? I mean, you can ask yourself, um, what is the region in the domain um, corresponding? to a fixed value of g of x, y, z. So that is to say you set up g of x, y, z with a number. So like for example, in this case, let's say I want to figure out um, the region in the domain corresponding to uh, the value of the function equal to, um, let's see, two. And notice that actually the way I wrote this function um, it cannot actually go beyond 3, right? Because, I mean, the, really the largest possible quantity under the radical is 9, right? I mean, that corresponds to 0, 0, 0 for x, y, and z. So if I want to know where is 2 located, I'm going to just have to figure out what this geometrically this, this looks like. And in this particular case, just because the way I define the function, it happens to be a sphere, not a solid ball, just a sphere, right? Again, if I rearrange the terms, that's going to be a sphere of radius uh, square root of 5, right? Because x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 5. So as it turns out, just the sphere um, of square, uh, excuse me, just the sphere of radius square root of 5 is the level surface for which uh, the function itself is equal to, uh, to is equal to two. It's called the level surface because it is a surface. It's going to be a sphere. So, other uh, level surfaces in this particular case happen to be other spheres, right, of various radii, right. So the concentric spheres will be level surfaces in this particular case. Um, again, we're gonna we're gonna go over uh, some maple examples to visualize this. I want to close the written part with the. Uh, the other section, the other function here, just to emphasize that again, the, the shape of the domain can be uh, and can take lots of lots of forms, right? H of x, y, z given by 1 minus x squared, 4 minus y squared, 25 minus z squared. How do you establish the domain? Just like before, we want each radical to be positive. And 
independently, these, give, these inequalities will give you some bounds for the variables. If you solve for one minus x squared less than, uh, greater than zero, that's, that is to say x squared less than one, that gives you minus one and one for the bounds of x, minus two and two for the y bounds, and minus five and five for the z bounds. Whenever you have constant bounds for x, y, z, geometrically, that gives you a box domain. I mean, think logically, how do you combine this? Like, what are, what are all the points in the space for which uh, x, y, and z are in between constant bounds? That essentially gives you the shape of a box. Um, I don't want to start a new page. Actually, let me, let me see if I, sometimes there is a little bit of a delay when, um, and I don't want to